Hey, this is Tom from MVP Chess. Welcome back to my series on Bobby Fischer's seminal work, My 60 Memorable Games. In this video, we'll be analyzing game number 37 that Fischer played versus Paul Karras in Curacao in 1962. We've got an epic encounter from the Candidates Tournament coming up. Before we jump in, don't forget, smash that subscribe button and join Team MVP. Thank you so much for your support. Like Korchnoi, Karras also definitely has a claim to being the greatest player never to become world champion. We've already seen two legendary encounters that Fisher had with the Grandmaster from Estonia in games number 8 and 14, so be sure to check out the playlist and watch those videos if you haven't seen them. This game that we're about to review, game 37, was one of the pivotal games from the Canada tournament in 1962. So, Fischer with the black pieces responds to e4 with his favorite Sicilian. And after knight e2, Fischer plays d6. He has to be mindful about a transposition back to the open Sicilian. Okay, this is something you always have to contend with as a Sicilian player. These little move order tricks in the opening. But Karras decides instead to play a closed system of the Sicilian. Both players being Keto. Karras looking to expand in the center with d4, so Fischer shuts that down, pawn to e5. And after d3, we have knight g7. So Fischer adopting a development scheme similar to the Botvinnik system in the English opening. Pawn to a3. Now what Karras is looking to do here is provoke Fischer into playing pawn to a5. Okay, trying to shut down the b4 break when Karras would then pivot and play a4. So he would use 2 tempi with the a pawn, but his idea is to force Fisher to weaken the b5 square and land his knight there. Fisher doesn't bite though. He says, go ahead and play b4. I'm just going to castle my king and meet b4 with b6, which is what we have. Now notice Karras has made a lot of pawn moves, a lot of potentially weakening pawn moves. And after f4, Fischer decides to abandon the center in order to attack these potentially weak pawns. So instructive play. Now, with his next move, e5, Fischer said that Karras made that move with a poker face, as if it were the most natural move in the world. But they both knew that this was the last move that Karras wanted to make because it just weakened so many key squares, in particular the f5 square. So... Karras' pawn play has been refuted for the most part by, by Fisher. Bishop g4, h3, Fisher grabs and looks to open up the scope of his dark square bishop and also apply more pressure to Karras' center. So that's why he plays pawn to f6. Now Fisher has established a lot of pressure on this e5 pawn. So to try to keep it together, Karras plays b5 to kick the knight to the side of the board. And then after knight d2, we have a series of exchanges. Fisher wants to liquidate this donkey on the side of the board, so that's why he played knight b3. Now he's taken away Karras' advantage of the two bishops. And after queen c7, is just going to look to apply more pressure to white center. So Karras reinforces. We have rook d8, knight h2, Fisher expands. Okay, potentially eyeing some of these weak squares in white's position, in particular the e3 square. We have a capture. And after knight f3, Fisher starts his dark square strategy with bishop h6. We have queen a2. And Karras does infiltrate with the queen, but Fisher is able to play his knight into e3 anyway. Notice that Knight takes d4 in this position would lose to queen c5. Pin and win. Thank you very much. So we have knight h2, and Fisher lands his pony on e3. So this is an octopus knight right now. And if Fisher can manage to coordinate the heavy artillery, i.e. the queen and rook with this knight on e3, it's going to be curtains for Karras. So Karras comes up with a really nice move in this position. Bishop c6, okay? So still eyeballing some of the weak light squares on the king side, but 
plugging up the C file so that Fisher can't, for example, bring his queen into C2 and start infiltrating the position. So nice defensive move. We have rook f8, knight f3, bishop f4, knight takes, and bishop takes. Notice in this position, the rook cannot take here on pain of bishop takes d4. The rook would be lost. So that's why Karras plays knight f3. And Fisher keeps playing on the dark squares with bishop d4, defending this knight. Now, if knight takes d4, which of course is the critical variation, Fisher would have queen g3. Again, it's all happening on these dark squares, okay? Queen g3 and then queen takes e1 would be the end of the road. That's why Karras felt compelled to eliminate this octopus knight. But this does allow Fisher's queen into the position, and Fisher's able to grab this pawn. So let's take stock of the position. So material is even, but we have an imbalanced endgame here, where Fisher has a rook and pawn versus two minor pieces. Now, Fisher has connected passers on the king side, which, in order to win the game, in order to make progress, he's going to look to advance up the board. The problem with doing that, though, and why this is a technically difficult position to try to win, is that it would expose the king, not necessarily to a direct attack, but to um, threats of a perpetual check. So, of course, Fisher's going to press on, but he's definitely got his work cut out for him in this position. King e1, queen f5, d4, King g7, Fisher starting to coordinate his pieces for the advance of the pawns. And we have h5. King g3, queen g4, rook f4, queen e7, and king h7. So slowly but surely, Fisher making some progress. In this position, the game was adjourned. Um, so Karras sealed his next move, which he unveiled as queen e2. And after putting that on the board after the adjournment, he offered Fisher a draw, which Fisher declined, of course. Fisher had such a strong will to win, and why not? You know, if anyone has winning chances in this position, it's black. He can also look to press with very little risk. Really, the only risk that he has in this position is a perpetual check, and then the game would end in a draw anyway. But at least he's given himself some winning chances. So, nice instructive psychological uh, lesson from Fisher here. Queen f5, queen e3, breaking the pin, advancing the pawn with g5. So Fisher slowly but surely trying to make some progress. And here he says he was just trying to give some checks, maybe looking to provoke Karras to step wrong and bring his king to uh, a dangerous square. But Karras was up to the task. Fisher here just kind of playing with his food a little bit. But of course, he's going to still look to advance. Now, King g7, this signals that Fisher is ready to resume the advance of the pawns. He wants to be able to play g4 without self-pinning this rook. We have King g3, and here come the pawns. h4, rook g4, rook g3, and g4. So Fisher making some progress here, but the game's still equal knight h2 queen g5 rook h3 so these last two moves knight f knight f1 and rook h3 were the last moves made uh before the second time control by both players and fisher grabs this pawn on a3 so fisher's up some material now so Karras looks to advance his central passer as well to create some counterplay. G3, the pawns are starting to get a little bit dangerous. Bishop D7. And rook E1. So notice, Fisher's made some progress with the pawns, but as we foreshadowed before, look how open the king is now. Okay, That's why Fisher brought the queen back to F6 to just defend against annoying checks from the queen and the bishop very hard to push these pawns and defend the king simultaneously from checks 
d6, rook e5, queen g4, the king steps to f8, and Fisher, of course, gets his rook behind the pass pawn. So, Karras has quickly advanced his pawn all the way to d7, one square away from promotion, and has created a lot of counterplay for himself. But Fisher thought in this position that he had a win. So, pause your videos. What is Black's best try in this position? It turned out not to be a winning move, although if you're going to play for a win in this position, this is definitely the critical move to play. So, have a think. What should Black play in this position? So, congratulations if you found the game continuation. It's objectively the best move in the position, although the game is still a draw is rook takes d7 okay with the idea of eliminating white's source of counterplay and deflecting the bishop away from the f-file so that fisher can infiltrate and then grab this knight okay now he's ready to advance this g pawn up the board king takes h4 pawn to g2 fisher thought he was winning here but with a series of very precise checks by the queen Karras can actually manage to save the half point. Okay, so we have queen b4, king f7, best move, queen b3, king g7, best move, queen g3, king h7, best move. And in this position, Karras found a really brilliant save. I'll give you the opportunity to find it yourself. Pause your videos. How did Karras save this position? So according to the engine, there are a couple moves that draw here, but the logical one, the more human move is what Karras played. And Fisher gave this move an exclam in his annotations. Queen to e5. Wow. This must come as quite a surprise to Fisher. Um, and he says, you know, as I looked at the position, I realized that Black's winning chances were gone. So... The surprising thing about this move, of course, is that it allows Fisher to promote the pawn. Now, this was not the game continuation, but we can see here that after bishop f5, king h6 would be checkmate, okay? So there's definitely some danger in the position for Fisher. So the king would step to g8, but then, unfortunately, Fisher has walked into... A perpetual check there's really nothing for him him to be able to do in the position as we foreshadowed it's so hard to win these uh these type of end games when the when there are queens on the board especially when you're advancing a pawn majority in front of your own king your king just doesn't have any shelter from these checks and it creates so many drawing chances for the defending player so that's why fisher played queen h1 in this position the bishop interposed fisher took promoted here and after queen e7 king h8 queen f8 king h7 queen f7 the players agreed to a draw in this position so why did they do that okay let's take a look quickly at what would happen if fisher played the natural queen g7 okay because fisher does have an extra pawn here but it's definitely a theoretical draw we would have this capture and then Karras would have a very important move in this position. There is only one move to draw for white. So I'll tell you what, I'll give you the chance to, to solve this yourself. Pause your videos. What would be white's only move to draw in this position? So if you decided on King g4, I am sorry, that is a total blunder. Black would gain the opposition and would be able to, in this position, shoulder away the king, and this position is completely winning. The only drawing move in the position is king g3, maintaining the distant opposition. Okay, very, very important. So if you're unfamiliar with this concept, king opposition, distant opposition, Definitely something that you want to 
um, investigate on your own. But we'll leave queen f7 as the final move on the board. So with this game, Fisher grabs the half point in the candidates tournament. With our next game, game number 38, we're going to take a look at another battle between Fisher and Karras and Carousel. So you're not going to want to miss that. Be sure, smash your subscribe button and join Team MVP, and I'll see you for that video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.